on the last day invariably pan india where the courts are on it was the last day of the testing times where the courts were being attended and we thought that we had discussed lot of lot of lot of uh, national law and very few webinars we had conducted in respect of the international perspectives and we thought that we could not travel internationally but at least we can bring international sources of law while discussing the various perspective as to how and what is the value of the treaties and what are the international customs what is the significance of the customary international law these could be the sources what is the sanctity of all this at the first blush it looks very simplicity though we discuss of international law but normally as as one experiences we normally don't discuss as such what could be the sources and what could be the aspects and what is the way forward in all these aspects keeping in view that there are christmas holidays and we had among we have amongst us dr t r subramaniam a dean of the cmr school college as well as a former vice chancellor of karnataka state university of law who had also been the advisor to the king of berin and his knowledge on the international perspectives is widely acknowledged not only in the academic fronts but to all those who have been associated or are because we all know that in while we are studying in law international law is an important subject but how do we actually use it we will take at the end of the session while we will talk with dr subramania to the effect that what was his experience while being an advisor to a king and what are the different facets from the democratic setup and at the same time we would also like as to what could be the since he has the academic perspectives what could be the careers in international law and what are the opportunities and what could be the way forwards but be that as it may since the primary topic would be the sources of international law we would request dr subramania tr to give his insights on a vital subject uh, over to you sir and it's a pleasure connecting with you yeah. on the social media through facebook as well as on this platform and we had heard uh, a lot of praises from uh, dr Ch uh, justice Chand uh, chandrashekar so it's always you. a pleasure yeah. he said you should hear him first i said your your words are gold if you have said it means one person has to be good and when you shared the resume i said that not only the package was good but the product was also good over to you sir <laughs> thank you thank you very much a uh, very good evening to all of you uh, uh, first uh, about 5 minutes i shall speak about uh, uh, my uh, position as an legal advisor to the kingdom of bahrain uh, i served in the state of bahrain first in the ministry of legal affairs uh, for about 2 2 years at a later date the ministry of legal affairs actually merged with the ministry of cabinet affairs i was working in the ministry of cabinet affairs totally i had worked about 7 year 8 months in the state of bahrain now uh, most of the difficulties which a legal advisor faces first and foremost when he goes abroad naturally the concerned senior officers will give you certain international conventions for purpose of ratification now a, a student may be a first class first rank throughout i was one of them but then how you put your comments suppose for example when i went there the minister for legal affairs was a very tough man he was a doctorate from the university of cambridge hussein al bahna and this man was a member of the international law commission for a period of 17 years and he was a minister for law and justice for a period of almost 26 years in the state of bahrain so i had the privilege of working under him and immediately on the day i went he said relax and go through the files which are kept in almer and immediately the next day he gave me a treaty and this treaty happened to be the world trade organization now first he said whether the state of bahrain should become a party and if so what are the reasons and he said i need the document tomorrow and the whole day i sat and the whole night i sat and prepared a document of 24 pages and when i prepared the document for 24 pages 
The next day when I submitted, he just called me. Dr. Subramanya, you may be learned. But then no minister will have the time or the no secretaries will have the time to read 24 pages. First and foremost, the answer should be in three paragraphs. Now, whether the state of Bahrain should become a party. If it intends to decide a party, for what reason? And what exactly are the financial commitments if it becomes a party in this year? And whether it violates the domestic law of the state of Bahrain in this event of becoming a party. So that is where I just learned through his mouth how a legal advisor, when he takes his office, when he assumes his office, he is supposed to put a comment. And then afterwards, they never looked back. And when I resigned and came back, they again still wanted to be there. That is what, what is the office of a legal advisor is. So a legal advisor, when he advises the government, he should take into consideration any, dis, any opinion when he gives, whether it violates the concerned law of the state where he is functioning. And the second important thing is, if it violates, which law is that? And what remedial measures are being provided to that law? And how it can be done? That also has to be indicated there. Now, the second most important thing is, what exactly is the financial commitment of the concerned country? Now, most of the, remember, if, an, if the opinion comes, if it comes for an opinion, after the month of August or September, they will not refer it to, and they will keep it in cold storage. And they will say this can be considered only in the next financial year. Because no government, when once the budget of a state is approved, intends to become a party to a treaty. And only it recommends that provision should be made or allocated to this treaty in the budget, then only the state can become a party to it. And other important thing is what purpose, what interest it is going to serve to a country when it becomes a party to the treaty. Is it just casual or is it going to benefit or, or the people of the state of Bahrain are going to derive any benefit out of it? Or when once it is signed, will it be kept in the cold storage forever? Those, these are the things a legal advisor is supposed to know. Now, having said this much, I will just go to the sources of international law. But when we take up the source of international law, naturally, you might be knowing. We, when we study the general laws, you study something known as jurisprudence. Now, in jurisprudence, we have certain sources of law. Now, certain sources of law, remember, are classified as, as authoritative sources. Now, which are the authoritative sources of law? Now, the first one is in the national legal system, enacted laws. All the laws which are enacted by the parliament in the state of India or in some other countries, some other organs which are meant for this purpose in the state of the United States, the Senate is an authoritative source of law. Then the, thereafter, the second important thing is case law. Cases which are decided by a court of law is an authoritative source. As students of law or scholars in law, you might be knowing a judgment delivered by the Supreme Court of India shall be binding on all courts. Now, this is for purpose of certainty, for purpose of uniformity, and for purpose of consistency. Uniformity, certainty, and consistency is, remember, the basic rule of precedent. And every lawyer, when a client goes to him, should be in a position to, remember, advise him whether he is going to win a case or lose a case because of the decision of a particular court, that is the apex court. Now, thereafter, we have customary laws. Now, the customary laws naturally derive their inspiration from what we call as sources in customs. There are several customs which I shall speak to you in international law when I take up. And thereafter, we have conventional law. Now, especially in the state of Great Britain, you have wonderful conventions. These conventions are to be respected. And initially, remember, this may have acted by way of protocol. Over a period of time, this protocol have resulted in the way of convention and it has to be respected by everyone. That is why these are the sources of what we call as the municipal law or state law. 
If these are the sources in a municipal law or state law, what exactly are the sources in international law? Now, prior to 1920, prior to the establishment of the League of Nations, there were five sources in international law. Now, we've been interested to know what are these five sources. First one is international custom. International custom has to be respected as a source of international law. Then international treaties. Now, treaties are not casually signed. Before a treaty is adopted, there will be discussions. And these discussions take place at several places in different places. And when I speak about the Convention of the Law of the Sea, just think of it. The third Conference of the Law of the Sea, remember, start, began its discussion or began starting, started, started adopted adoption of the Convention of the Law of the Sea. Remember, it was in the year 1973. But then for a period of nine years, the discussion went on. And only in the year 1982, they were able to adopt the Convention of the Law of the Sea. That is why it is an important treaty for all of us. And it actually determines the breadth of the territorial sea. It determines the law of continental shelf and the resources within the continental shelf. We we'll speak about the 200 nautical mile exclusive economic zone of a particular country. It speaks about the resources which are found beyond the national jurisdiction of a state and it's the voyage and the journey and what we call as the maritime belt. Now, these are certain things that are adopted in a convention rule where a, a convention and when once it is adopted and when once it is adopted and ratified by state, it is binding on all of us. That is what, what is called as conventional rules. Now, the third source of law, especially in international law prior to 1920 happened to be decisions of the judicial and arbitral tribunals. Now, decisions of the judicial and arbitral tribunals naturally constitute a source of law. There are plenty of judicial decisions, especially by the International Court of Justice and its predecessor, the Permanent Court of International Justice. These are to be respected. Although it is not going to create a precedent, the law which is being laid down by it are respected by everyone, including the international courts. I can just tell you one instance so that you understand the point better. In 1949, the International Court of Justice delivered a decision, especially in the reparation case. And in the reparation case, for the first time, the International Court of Justice pointed out international institutions like the United Nations, as well as its subsidiary organs, have a personality of its own. Since it has a personality of its own, it can sue as well as be sued in its own name. Remember, these things need not be taken up by the court again and again and again. It is decided already and everyone knows this. International institutions have a personality of its own. So that is why judicial and arbitral decisions used to constitute a source of law. Then there are towards decisions or determinations of the international institutions. Now, for example, right from 1921, the International Labour Organization is an organization it has assumed certain powers, and these powers are assumed by it to regulate the conditions of the working class. And this need not be, remember, discussed further. ILO means it, is, it has come into existence and came to be established to, to determine and to protect the rights of the working class. That is where decisions or determinations of the international institutions constitute a source of law. Now, if this is, and then the fifth source happened to be juristic works. Juristic, juristic works, when I speak about scholars who have worked for years, remember, quote certain things, write something, authoritatively prove certain things. At that time, these can be quoted as a source of international law before the International Court of Justice or before the Court of Arbitration or before some other court. And it is not to everybody, juristic writings, for example, there are certain cases which I'll explain a little later, wherein they went to the extent of pointing out jur juristic works or the writings of the most highly qualified publicist is a source of international law. Now, when in the year 1920, before the Permanent Court of International Justice came to be established, the League of Nations appointed a committee. And this committee is known as the Root Fillmore, as well as Mr. Root happened to be one, Root happened to be an American national, Lord Fillmore happened to be a British. 
and these two scholars were requested to draft the statute of the world court and when they drafted the statute of the world court they were they have taken every point into consideration and having taken every point into consideration they said there should be only four sources of international law now which are the four sources under the statute of the international court of justice now the first one is the place of custom is being taken over by treaties now under the present day international law treaties play a major role on every subject you cling on and you find remember treaties so for example the entire world trade is being recognized by a treaty which is known as the world trade organization the entire aerial navigation is regulated by what we call as international civil aviation organization the entire matters pertaining to food is being uh, all regulated by the treaties which are bind, uh, signed by the food and agriculture organization matters relating to health are being taken care by the world health organization and the world world health assembly matters pertaining to united nations environment program and environmental issues are being taken up by the united nations environment program now that is why now these organizations or specialized agencies have signed several treaties and these treaties are for the benefit of humanity everyone should benefit out of these treaties and these rules are to be regularized this is for the welfare of the people and not for anyone's benefit that is why it constitutes a source of international law now there are towards i just intend to speak to you the third source the third source is an important source for the first time they included general principles of law recognized by the civilized nations now general principles of law recognized by the civilized nations is a common source because certain principles derive its practice from the legal system of states and this principle if it is commonly found commonly accepted commonly believed and commonly enforced naturally it becomes a source of international law that is why it is called the general principles of law recognized by civilized nations now the fourth one happened to be judicial decisions and the writings of the most highly qualified publicists as an evidence to a source of law which i have just spoken to you now judicial decisions for example you have plenty of judicial decisions delivered by the international court of justice although they don't constitute as source of law they can be an evidence to say this is what international court of justice has said and we one more along with this are the judicial decisions and the writings of the most qualified publicists highly qualified publicists over a period of time they have said this is the law this has to be respected now this has led to the development of the principle of neutrality this has led to the concept of piracy and in all these matters the learned people who have contributed something to the growth of international law have been consulted and their view points have been relied upon <coughs> now we go to one by one treaties as source of international law now when i speak about treaties as source of international law treaties are first classified as the treaties which are called as which create universal rules of international law when i speak about treaties which create universal of rules of international law there is only one treaty under the present day international law that is the charter of united nations why i speak about the charter of united nations you just go through article 2 paragraph 6 of the charter of united nations article 2 paragraph 6 of the charter of united nations points out even non members of the united nations are supposed to act in conformity with the charter of united nations when i speak about this non members of the united nations states who are not members of the united nations are also supposed charter of united nations you may ask me what are those principles first one is maintenance of international peace and security the second one is international cooperation the third one is protection of human rights even non members of united nations are supposed to act and respect this that is why it is a universal universal treaty so the first classification treaties are classified into treaties which create universal rules of international law 
The second one is treaties which create general rules of international law. Now, when I speak about general rules of international law, remember, you have treaties of different kinds. Not one type, hundreds of types of treaties are being signed. Now, take an instance, instance relating to a treaty on weights and measures. Well, it's very much essential and it is uniformly followed. Kilograms, weights and measures, treaties on Red Cross, treaties on aerial navigation, treaties on world trade, treaties on law of the sea, treaties creating to regional institutions, treaties on the protection of human rights. How many of them you want? Starting from the 1966 in a, in a, in a convention on relating to the protection of civil and political rights, convention relating to the civil, uh, the, the economic, social and cultural rights, convention relating to the protection of human rights of child convention. How many of you there? And simultaneously, international labor standards it has adopted as many as 189 conventions and more than 202 resolutions adopted by the International Labor Organization. All of them, all of them are sources of international law. The International Court of Justice in a particular case is empowered to refer this. And there are plenty of instances they have referred to it and remember, uh, have gone further. Now these treaties, treaties which create general rules of international law have been further classified into lawmaking treaties as well as treaty contracts. Now, when I speak about lawmaking treaties, for example, the entire issues pertaining to the law of the sea is discussed threadbare for nine years and has come in the form of a treaty. That is what we call as a conventional rule, lawmaking treaty, law of the sea, convention of 1982. Simultaneously, we have a treaties on the Red Cross. We have treaties on the, the Geneva Conventions of the Prison World, Prisoners of War, and the Convention on the Wounded and the Sick, Convention on the Wounded and the Shipwrecked. Now, these are all convention rules in the event of a war. Otherwise, remember, there will be a trial of Nuremberg. That is going to happen. Now, that is where you have conventional rules, treaty making, authority to treaty making rules and on different subjects, and it has to be expected, respected and adhered to by everyone. Now, the second one is treaty contracts. Now, when I speak about treaty contracts, this has developed through bilateral means. It doesn't have any multilateral origin. Now, what are these treaties which are of bilateral nature? And treaties which are of bilateral in nature later turned into be a multilateral in character. Now, there are one or two instances I can just give you so that you understand the point better. One is relating to the office of the council. Now, if you look to the history of the Romans and prior to that, the history of the Greeks, they used to appoint a particular person with whom the state of Greece or the state of Rome had a trade relationship. And this person in modern terminology is called as the council. And then he is called as the consular general. So the office of the consular or the office of the consular general in its origin has taken place through bilateral means. Two countries, when they establish trade relationship, in order to protect the trade, the investing state or the concerned state which has sent its nationals, sends a particular person to look after the interest of that state and its nationals. That is what, what we call as the office of the consul today. This, is, this has its origin through bilateral means. Now then the other important thing is treaties on extradition. All the extradition treaties until this date have bilateral means. For example, we are asking someone to be extradited. And suppose, for example, heinous and serious crimes are committed by a particular person and he escapes to a foreign country. When he escapes to a foreign country, the country from where he has escaped is interested in trying. And for the sake of trial, remember, it enters into an extradition treaty with that country. Having entered into an extradition treaty, it gets him, he gets extradited, and then the proceedings will begin. Now, how did it start? It has started only through bilateral means. And today, most of the countries have extradition treaties. And through their extradition treaties, 
they decide that seniors or heinous crime should not go unpunished. That is the way, that is the law, that is the practice that is being followed by states today. That is where it is, it is bilateral nature. Now with which we go to discuss the second source which is called as custom as a source of international law. Now when I speak about custom, remember custom in order to constitute a source naturally, pass one step ahead of usage. Now always we speak about usage. Now usages, remember, may differ from region to region and from place to place. But then custom is not like that. Custom is unified and self-consistent. Always custom, when we say it acquires the force and the characteristics of law. In order to acquire the force and characteristics of law, remember, it has to sustain for several years. It must have been accepted as kushkasna. It must have been applied before a court of law for certainty. And the courts having heard the case must have said it is a kush custom, then it can be accepted and practiced. And remember, usage is always consistently maybe inconsistent. And you know, in the most of the cases, they are consistently inconsistent because it doesn't have unified character in it. But self custom is always self-consistent and self-deserving. Now, custom has other two elements, important elements. To constitute a custom as a custom, first and foremost, the first element is material element. Now, what is this material element? Now, when I speak about the material element, there should be a repetition of the act. The alleged act, when it goes to the court of law, is of such a nature wherein the party should be in a, in a position to prove that there is not one single occurrence. There were occurrences, repetitions, re-repetitions, and repetitions. And over a period of time, this gets the characteristics of the custom. That is why what you will call as the material element. Now, the, then the second one is psychological element. When I speak about the psychological element, the psychological element simply points out the custom which is being spoken or alleged before the court of law must have been established in such a way that no civilized community dare not violate such a custom. So the nature of the rule which is being quoted for a purpose of endorsement is of such a nature that no civilized community dare not violate such a custom. That is what is being spoken. Only in these circumstances it can be accepted as a custom. Now I shall explain to you two cases to understand the point better. Now, the first case happened to be a, a case which is known as a, a Westland Central Gold Mining Company versus R. Now, in the Westland Central Mining Gold Company versus R, it was a decision of the King's Bench in the year 1905. The facts are very simple. Now, the Westland Central Gold Mining Company was a registered company in England. And this company, which is registered in England, was functioning at Transvaal in the state of South Africa. When the company was actually functioning, two parcels of gold belonging to the company were seized by the South African government employees. The then South African law pointed out, the finder of the goods to restore the goods to the proper owner. It is the duty of the founder of the goods to restore it to the proper owner. That means the South African government employees, if they have seized the goods, it has to be restored to the company. Now, what had happened was, this is a case in 19, uh, 1899. Now, that year, remember, South Africa was completely captured or conquered by the state of Great Britain. And when South Africa was captured by the state of Great Britain, the conqueror became answerable. The company is registered in the state of England. And since it is registered in the state of England, it filed a suit before the court of law that the gold parcels should be restored to the company. So the matter came up for hearing and the state of Great Britain, while defending the case, pointed out in cases relating to conquest, it is ultimately left to the discretion of the successor state. In all cases related to conquest, it is left to the privileges of successor state to whether to give up the obligations or not give up, give up the obligations. 
you cannot compel you cannot force you cannot coerce in situations like this the claim of the company failed now the answer is the consent rule relating to conquest was established in such a way wherein the conqueror was supposed to determine whether to take up the obligations of predecessor or not there is no question of compulsion that is where the claim of the company was failed there was a customary rule of international law in this case now the another important case in this case happened to be the famous lotus case now in the lotus case what has happened was lotus was a mail steamer and which was lotus was a french mail steamer a public ship for the state of france which was actually proceeding to the coast of constantinople when it was proceeding to the port of constantinople well, it was still not yet reached but about to reach there is a collision and this collision was actually caused by the french commander in chief mr demons mr demons collided with a turkish vessel and eight turkish nationals lost their lives and afterwards the concerned vessel went beneath the seabed and some uh, subsoil beneath the sea after this act he actually drove straight away his ship to the port of constantinople when he reached the port of constantinople the turkish authorities arrested him when they arrested him mr demons on the, and the french government contended you cannot exercise jurisdiction on us in all public vessels remember a public vessel is considered as the floating island and since it is considered as a floating island only the nationality of the ship's flag that is the french flag is supposed to exercise jurisdiction and not the state of turkey and when no compromise was not possible the matter went to the permanent court of international justice now before the permanent court of international justice the state of france pointed out it is a customary rule of international law that in all collision cases as the one which has taken place now it is the nationality of the flag's jurisdiction that is exercisable and no other jurisdiction french ju jurisdiction only is the natural choice but not the turkey jurisdiction Now the international court of justice were very clever first class we are we are to agree they were then why don't you come and give evidence and prove that it is a custom could you bring in at least 10 illustrations instances of this type that has taken place and accepted by the international community they said we need some more time the international court of justice gave time and when it reappeared after 6 months before the international court of justice it was not in a position to give a very good one instance of this type now in exercising jurisdiction the custom that was prevailed in those days was consistently inconsistent and with the result the claim of the state of france failed the state of turkey pointed out by using the same principle it is a case where the repercussions of the act of mr demons has affected the turkish territory the result killing the eight turkish nationals has a direct remember bearing on the turkish soil that is why we exercise jurisdiction my professor of international law when i was studying in the school of international studies put a question to me and he has brought and he has caused put the question general question to all the students he just gave the entire decision of the lotus case decided by the permanent court of international justice and he said could you please tell me what exactly is the ratio dissidentity of this case we were not able to tell then after two hours remember he showed removed some page and in that page he said there is no rule of international law which prohibits turkey from exercising jurisdiction this is what he said there is no rule of international law which prohibits turkey from exercising jurisdiction is the rule of law in the concerned case so that is how remember you find custom means the material element has to be proved and the psychological element i have explained to you that no civilized community they are not violate such a rule which is found in the western central gold mining company versus r now remember 
This, the international courts, whether the permanent court of international justice or the present court of international justice will not accept that easily, what you say. Whatever you say has to be proved before the court of law. And when once it is proved before the court of law, the court will explain its judgment, this is the jural quality. Justice Cardozo, when he speaks about these things, he just says, what exactly is the jural, jural quality of the custom? Now, for this purpose, remember, to explain the general quality of custom, remember, he explained a beautiful case. And this case is known as what we Pequit Habana and the Lola. Pequit Habana and the Lola happened to be a decision of the American Supreme Court delivered in the year 1899. I shall just tell you the facts of the case in three sentences. Pequit and Habana and the Lola were registered ships. And they were registered, remember, in Cuba. And at that time, the uh, Spaniards were actually controlling it. There was a declaration of war between the state of Cuba as well as the, the state of United States. It is actually in the state of Spain as well as the state of United States. Now, during the course of war, what has happened was these two fishing vessels, smacks they are called, Pequod, Havana and Dalola were going on a voyage. When they were on voyage, the American gunboat naturally came to the spot, having come to the post. Remember, they searched the vessel and nothing was found out, but still they arrested the vessel. Having arrested the vessel, they take it to Florida. Having taken it to Florida, these two vessels were sold in auction and they took the money and went away. But the point it is is the owners of the vessel did not keep quiet. And they filed an application before the United States Supreme Court to claim possession of the vessel. And in order to claim possession of the vessel, they just argued one important thing. And the important thing is, under the existing rules of international law, all vessels which are taking it innocently, pursuing innocently their activities, are immune from the subject of capture. These two vessels did not know the declaration of war between the state of And these two vessels are, remember, just going for the sake of food and catching the daily live food and coming back and selling it in auction and afterwards taking it home, whatever they require on a day-to-day -day basis. So they were innocent. And before the court of law, they said, American gunboat officers, the other vessel, they searched the vessel. They could not find AK-47 rifles. They could not find a grenade. They could not find arms. They could not find ammunition. And the ship was totally innocent and they did not know the declaration of war and it should be released forthwith. Remember, the American court, remember, presided over by Justice Gray and his team, went to the extent of pointing out that the ship should be released forthwith. And during the course of judgment, I just intend to quote you one of the sentences which was uttered, written by Justice Gray. He said, international law is part of our law. Courts in this country should respect this law. Where there is no treaty, where there is no custom, resort must be had to the writings of the most qualified publicists who declare what international law is and not what it ought to be. That is how it was respected. The courts declared what international law is, not it, what it ought to be. That is the way it was respected. Having said this much, I will go to the third source. General principles of law recognized by civilized nations. As I just indicated to you, general principles of law recognized by civilized nations simply means there are principles of law and these principles of law are commonly found, commonly applied, commonly enforced in most of the legal systems of the world. And if they are found commonly in most of the legal systems of the world, why it should not become a source of international law? That was the point that was, remember, that came up before the International Court of Justice. Now you may be interested to know what are these general principles of law recognized by civilized nations. Now, when I speak about this, first and foremost, principles of good faith. 
principles of good faith is a general principle of law recognized by civilized nations anywhere in the world even in the communist countries then principles of comparative law it is a remember general principle of law recognized by civilized nations then the other one is human rights the doctrine of human rights is a general principle of law recognized by civilized nations anywhere they may oppress or suppress but then it makes them to go under depression because the others criticizing that is why remember protection of human rights enforcement is a general principle of law recognized by civilized nations now there are several issues which came before the court of law and in these issues they said certain principles which are found in the statute book are general principle of law recognized by civilized nations a case came up before the permanent court of international justice and the name of the case is corzu factory case in the corzu factory case which was decided in 1928 the permanent court of international justice pointed out the doctrine of res judicata is a general principle of law recognized by civilized nations so when one say court decides a particular case on a particular issue on a particular point of law the same court is not supposed to hear the same case again don't you think this is found in almost all the legal systems of the world and for the first time the international court of justice gave endorsement to it and said remember the doctrine of res judicata is a general principle of law in france by civilized nations then there came another case which came in the year 1924 and the case which came in 1924 happened to be the mevramatis palestines concessions case in the mevramatis palestine concessions case the permanent court of international justice pointed out the doctrine of subrogation is a general principle of law recognized by civilized nations the most for example a particular person because of the conduct of some other person loses and when he loses something naturally the person who is responsible in causing such a misery should step into his shoes no this is a general principle of law recognized by civilized nations so naturally it has to be respected doctrine of subrogation is a general principle of law recognized by civilized nations now there came in the year 1937 a beautiful case anglo american equitable rules now in them uh, uh, there was a case which came up diversion of water from the river mews in diversion of water from the river river mews the permanent court of international justice in 1937 pointed out the anglo american equitable principles or the equitable doctrine are general principle of law recognized by civilized nations now this case is an important case remember after 1950 and 1960 1970 1980 several cases came before the international court of justice in all of them the international court of justice pointed out the doctrine of equitable principles are general principle of law recognized by civilized nations now one such case happened to be so that you understand the point better the famous case which is known as uh, north sea continental shelf cases in the north sea continental shelf cases remember it was a case relating to the sharing of the adjacent states the sharing of the continental shelf of adjacent states now on the one side you have the state of uh, uh, germany and you have the state of denmark and the state of uh, uh, federal republic of holland so the state of holland the state of germany and the state of denmark it was in concavity shape how do you share the continental shelf beneath the sea bed and subsoil between adjacent states now it was given in the 1958 convention of the law of the sea where you have a continental shelf it has to be divided by the median line the state of germany said median line is not going to work it should be on equitable principles first and foremost the natural prolongation of the land territory must be taken into consideration by taking into consideration the view points of the experts in geology by taking into consideration the view points of the experts in morphology and geography and naturally the continental shelf which has spread into beneath the sea bed and subsoil must be gone to the go to that state to which it belongs and the international court of justice for the first time agreed and gave a judgment for the state of germany by endorsing the equitable principles although 
the state of germany was not uh, ratified the 1958 geneva convention the law of the sea a lot of things if i start speaking that itself will take one hour now then when we go further you have other principles as well doctrine of trust is a general principle of law recognized by the civilized nations so for example a, a trustee he is supposed to hold a trust property on behalf of others suppose for example in the state of united in the, in the, in the under the united nations system south africa was appointed as a trustee to look after the territory of namibia and when south africa was appointed as a trustee to look after the territory of namibia south africa instead of giving them self determination instead of giving them independence started remember violating looting and taking away almost all the resources for itself by itself at that time the matter went before the international court of justice and international court of justice gave three advisory opinion one in 1950 the other one is in 1966 and the third one is 1971 now for the first time in the 1971 decision i am quoting from the first line it said the very presence of south africa in the territory of namibia is illegal south africa should end its colonialism in all its forms and manifestations and south africa should pay way for the self determination and independence of the sovereignty of the state of namibia that is what we call the concept of self determination so doctrine of trust remember is a general principle of law recognized by the civilized nations all through all countries of the world there are several other general principles that are being recognized i just intend to speak to you of a great scholar in international law professor harsh lotterpad he was a professor of international law at the university of cambridge and he was a viewer professor holding a chair and from there he rose to dizzy heights and became a judge in the international court of justice now when he became a judge in the international court of justice remember he had to deliver only a few cases during his tenure and in one of his judgments he went to the extent of pointing out the doctrine of equitable principles protection of human rights doctrine of subrogation doctrine of uh, res judicata are the general principles he wrote a book and the name of the book is private law sources and analogies to international law and the private law, source, law, law sources and analogies to international law happen to be a very great book it is honored respected and from there the general principle of law the united nations civilized nations have been developed by the community of nations and today it is considered as a source of international law the very recognition of the general principles has led to two important developments now first one is it is a death knell to positivism now there were scholars who are known as austin and bentham these scholars austin and bentham go to the extent of pointing out customs and treaties are the only source of international law now today along with the custom along with the treaties remember juristic writings general principle of law recognized by the civilized nations can also become a source of international law and their view point is being rejected all through all the time now now the other one is for exactly the other important development is the development relating to non liquor there were instances where in the international court of justice may refuse to hear a case because there are no provisions of law first and foremost in order to decide a case there should be sources and these sources are to be cited the task of an international lawyer unlike the lawyer practicing in the in the courts in a country is very difficult the international lawyer remember had to find out first and foremost customs the existing treaties that relate to a case general principles and at times he is always in the realm of uncertainty and when he is in the realm of uncertainty he has to use his own logic his own reasoning and his own mind power and his ingenuity and there he should excel in convincing the court that this is a source of international law and it has to be respected by everyone now having said this we go to the other important source which is called as judicial decisions now judicial decisions under article 59 of the statute of the whole court 
are not binding on the international court of justice the judgment of the international court of justice is not binding it is binding only on the parties to the dispute but then if you look to a series of judgments of the international court of justice the international court of justice as well as the courts in the municipal states in the municipal states in a country respects the decisions of the international court the first case which i had just mentioned to you happened to be the reparation case in the reparation case remember the united nations employees were serving throughout the world when they were serving throughout the world one of them a great colonel colonel bernadette was assassinated in the new city of jerusalem when he was assassinated the matter came up before the international court the matter was referred to the international court what rules of international law are to be applied can the united nations maintain a cause of action against such recalcitrant state the united nations uh, when it submitted its petition the international court of justice heard the case and they said united nations has a personality of its own it can sue it can be sued this was the decision and the representatives of the deceased are also entitled to get compensation that was a landmark judgment another judgment which i just wanted to tell you i can at least tell 10 but i will tell you only three here one uh, famous case happened to be the anglo norwegian fisheries case now remember the, the coast of norway is deeply indented it is in a curvature form in a zigzag form so when the coast of norway is in a zigzag form or in an indented form it is not made by the state of norway it is by morphology it is by geography it by geology the state of norway in order to measure its territorial sea adopted the box method what is this box method the king of norway in 1935 elect selected certain points and these small islands road states and fjords were remember taken as the box from one point to the other and a straight line is being drawn the area inward side is called as the internal waters the area outside the the line is called as the territorial sea up to a particular distance now the state of england objected to this under a customary rule of international law the territorial sea of a particular country has to be measured by adopting the low water mark on the new moon or the sun moon on uh, the other moon, new moon day the water recedes to the lowest when the water recedes to the lowest it is called as a low water mark and from that area up to a distance of whatever 4 miles or 6 miles is your territorial sea you cannot have a box method select certain points and join them and from there you trust measuring it is not allowed to be done the matter went to the international court of justice before the international court of justice the state of norway contended on two things first and foremost it is what we call as a matter of geology the coast is deeply indented it is not done by us it is just not possible to do it also correct it also in a situation like this we have done it and we have done it very reasonably selected certain points certain road states certain small islands all of them put together and joined uh, by a thread like and from there outside it is called as the territorial sea inward is called as the internal waters the second important factor have to be economic factors peculiar to the region when i speak about the economic factors peculiar to the region remember the people of norway live on the resources it is the life blood naturally it has to be protected it needs sea sea resources are a resource economic resource for the country now the international court of justice gave a judgment for the first time for the state of norway when the judgment was given it was a revolutionary decision it was remember hailed by many many statesmen judgment judges and other scholars because uh, the contents of the state of great britain is the, the the state of norway is going against the customary rule of international law the international court of justice is said it is not against the customary rule of international law here a line is not possible since adoption of a line is not possible they have adopted it and they said when you adopt a line the international court of justice said you are 
not supposed to deviate from the general direction of the post. The line that is being conducted or the points that are being considered or the, the line that is being drawn between fissures and road states and islands and other things should not deviate from the general direction of the post. And it is allowed. That was another major important development that has taken place. Now, the other one which I have already spoken to you, the uh, important development happened with the North Sea continental shelf cases. Now, the other important case, very, very much essential, happened to be related to the United Nations itself, certain expenses case. Now, you might be knowing the East-West rivalry always used to surface before the meetings of Security Council. And I speak about the East-West rivalry up to the dismantlement of the Soviet state of Soviet Russia. This used to surface. Now, always there will be a Russian bloc, there will be the American bloc, NATO bloc. And with the result, it was not possible even for the admission of a particular member to get admitted as a member of the United Nations. So if a democratic country wants to get admission, Soviet Russia will oppose and its group will shout. And if one communist country intend to have a membership, the other countries would come. Now in circumstances such as this, for the first time, they refer to the International Court of Justice. This was, the, the question was put by the General Assembly to the ICJ. Can considerations other than put in Article 4 for the admission of membership be considered? Now, under Article 4, the admission of a member must take place by a resolution of the Security Council and a decision on it by the General Assembly. So it was asking, can we admit without the consent or without the resolution of the Security Council? They said, no, it is not possible. It is one of the conditions under the Charter of United Nations. And these conditions are to be met. That is where United Nations is protected by the International Court of Justice. Now, the second one is relating to maintenance of international peace and security. When I speak about international peace and security, always the Security Council is supreme. And in important decisions relating to peace and security, the consent of the big five is very much essential. Under the Charter of United Nations, you have a static element. What is the static element? The big five were the five. The big five are the five. The big five will be the five in future also. And now the state of Great Britain and the state of France, remember, are were not worthy of it because there are very powerful countries more than the state of UK and France. Take India, take Brazil. You have many countries, but they are not getting about it. Now, because of the deadlock in the Security Council, to take a particular decision, when it failed to take a decision, the matter went before the United Nations General Assembly. And the General Assembly of the United Nations in certain important matters passed peacekeeping resolutions. When it passed the peacekeeping resolutions to send peacekeeping forces, it went before it and the resolutions were adopted. Now, what has happened was important thing is, one minute I will take. The important thing is, now this naturally uh, led to the expenses. Lots of expenses came in and the expenses are to be approved by the General Assembly. And when these expenses are to be approved by the General Assembly, the Security Council said, we are not going to approve this because you have indulged in an ultra-virus act. You don't have the permission to decide matters relating to peace and security. And matter, when it went to the International Court of Justice, it quoted the charter in the decision. Primary task of maintaining international peace and security rests with the Security Council but not the exclusive responsibility. You are an organ, you are supposed to act. And if you fail to act naturally, another organ of equal importance can take up the claim and decide the case. See, these are the decisions of the International Court of Justice. Although it is not binding, it is quoted by test group, it is quoted by authors, it is quoted by everyone, even in national courts. These are a few sources of international law. Once again, thank you. And if you have questions, I will answer. Yes, sir. 
so the session was spot on and i was surprised the way you took us to the entire gamut with so much ease it shows the immense knowledge which you have one is by dr shrikant p partha sarthi if one were to find the inherent jurist jurisprudence cutting across all the countries what would be that also are the regional agreement between the countries overriding the global uh, agreed laws example new york convention oh johnny sir ko bhi unmute kar uh, sir we will unmute you yeah yeah now uh, yeah, what is what, yeah, what, what is the first question sir uh, the first question is if one were to find inherent jurisprudence cutting across all the countries what would be that and also are the regional agreements between the countries uh, do i would reframe it do regional agreement between the countries override the globally agreed laws example new york convention now first and foremost i just intend to quote uh, one of the provisions of uh, uh, charter of united nations under article 102 of the charter of united nations all treaties shall be registered the parties to the treaties which they have not registered a particular treaty are not supposed to invoke the protection of the treaty and it will not they may sign the treaty but it will have no effect whatever type of treaty and this is done for the purpose of preventing the signing or entering into secret treaties this is one now the second important thing is whether it is inherent jurisdiction or whether it is natural jurisdiction as provided under the law united nations is going to survive united nations will survive even in future now suppose for example you take it this way now can you can you ever think of a, a, a think of a situation without the united nations suppose for example if a situation arises where you to think without the united nations you must have thought how this should be and what are the tools which are required to be corrected and new york treaty or any other treaty i'm just telling you it is all uh, i i just uh, intend to speak to you the the the, uh, the the administration of the state of united states the new president when he takes over he is prepared to ratify the treaty with iran the mistake which was committed by the present regime and that is where international law is going to be honored now initially some states say because we have not reached that level of maturity still state sovereignty and its hangover is prevailing on the state but then when it gets caught in the web of lies naturally they respect rules of international law that is the practice that is the practice of the state of soviet russia that was the practice in the state of united states now you think of the 1979 embassy crisis especially in the state of iran or the state of united states american embassy officials were trapped and a few of them were arrested at that time the state of united states wanted to respect rules of international law because wanted the release so states are always like this but then remember rules of international law initially when they speak uh, against it naturally when it comes to the fora respect it but then delay is taking place for example i can give you an instance in the year 19 Uh, 66 the united nations united nations covenants on human rights are adopted although it was adopted in the year 1966 for or in order to get 35 ratifications it took 10 years that means what even in the developed world the track of the united nations human rights are very very poor that is what international law is as always anything yes yeah yeah uh, this is in maritime law the law of the land manufacturer of a ship is also used in certain cases can a third nation be involved in dispute between two country in a, in the high seas under the existing circumstances uh, under the convention of the law of the sea uh, it is just not possible now th the third state may enter into 
with the consent of the state, but then the act that is being perpetrated should be in accordance with the provisions of the law of the C Convention of 1982. Yeah. Uh, this is by Rashmi Pujari. Considering the fact that all states uh, jealously guard their sovereignty, uh, is it possible to have an effective compliance with international law? For an effective ban? For an effective compliance with the international law. Okay, okay. Now, all the states, even today and even in the future, uh, intend to guard the sovereignty. But I just intend to bring home one fact. The moment you sign a particular treaty, your ego and your sovereignty to that extent is corrupt. How many treaties are there today? And where is sovereignty? Sovereignty, remember, as one of the writers points out, it is only a residuum of power which a state enjoys within the confines of international law. Long ago, as, long, as early as 1927, a great judge of the International Permanent Court of International Justice pointed out in one of the Serbian Sloan's case, sovereignty is what international law confers. This was said in 1927 in the Serbian loans case. Sovereignty is what international law confers. That means everything should be in accordance with the rules of international law. If you do anything outside it, you will not be in a position to get the respect because you have violated rules of international law. I still remember when the state of Israel uh, about 20 years ago, when it had violated a few of the international conventions, and in the annual General Assembly of the United Nations, when it addressed, there were six states just to listen to the speech. And members were out. They did not want. They did not listen. That is where rules to be carried out by everyone. Yeah. This is the question. Uh, international crime justice in the context of changing changes being brought by the modern technologies? Now, uh, uh, you have plenty of issues, especially in the area of modern technology there, and uh, treaties are being signed, treaties are being negotiated, and I am not in a position to specifically tell those treaties uh, uh, because if I start telling them, you may say you have not included and you have not included that. But uh, there are Technology is very much essential. Remember, for example, even the right to privacy, which is being recognized even at the international level. When we speak of the, uh, the work that is being done by the International or World Intellectual Property Organization regarding the adoption of conventions, you now these rights are being recognized, it has to be enforced. Although it is done by a specialized agency of the United Nations, WIPO, now, similarly, you have several things, for example, under the Food and Agricultural Organization, again, technology and technology issues coming. Even under the WTO World Trade Organization, there are issues relating to the introduction of technology and it has to be respected and adhered. All international civil aviation organization, remember, the earlier technology that was prevailed, prevailed up to the 1970s are being taken away. Now, new rules have come up and you have to function according to the new rules. Why new rules now? After the introduction of COVID, new technologies are being introduced. And these new technologies which are introduced at the, at the behest of the International Civil Aviation Organization are enforced at every airport. Then where is your sovereignty? Yeah. Uh, we have no other questions. Uh, before we part for the day, tomorrow at 4.30 p.m., uh, we will be having a session those who have been connected with Beyond Law and even otherwise on social media, people know that Bharat Chog is a very popular speaker having immense knowledge. So do stay connected with us tomorrow at 4 p.m., 4.30 p.m. Uh, uh, it is Understanding the uh, White Collar Crime by Bharat Chog. And thank you, sir, on behalf of all those who are watching us live on the Facebook and on this platform. The session, we never realized that uh, more than an hour has crossed, but the session was quite insightful and you spoke extempore and you were able to take us to the entire gamut of the international law in a short span. Words cannot actually express the way 
you have expressed it on behalf of everyone thank you thank you stay safe stay blessed thank you and tomorrow we should connect at 4:30 thank you